This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Bagman. That wild turkey looks good coming into view. It looks wonderful in your sights. And it will really appear outstanding when it's mounted in your home. We re-air a piece with Russ Kennedy talking about preparing your harvest for the taxidermist. Also, Kentucky Field TV's Tim Farmer stops by for some turkey chat. And how do you know when it's spring? A special report as we go inside outdoors. This week on Kentucky Field Radio. It's time to register for Kentucky's elk hunts. This is Tim Farmer. The Kentucky Fish and Wildlife website is elk central and the only place to enter this year's draw. Elk hunting in old Kentucky. Take it from me, there's nothing like it. 1,000 names will be drawn, and with the pick two option, you got to like your odds. The deadline is midnight, April 30th. The Kentucky Elk Draw. Enter at fw.ky.gov. Again, fw.ky.gov. At the absolute worst, it was a little white lie. A little white lie. After all, when it hit the line, it felt like a 15-pounder. It doesn't matter what the scale says. So it might be an ever-so-slight deviation from the truth. Sometimes in fishing, the truth is hard to catch. Maybe just a stretch. But the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife reminds you, fishing isn't about math. It's about fun. And fudging a little if you need to. Kentucky fishing. It'll make a liar out of you. You're listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. My name is Russ Kennedy, and our guest on the show today has been with us many times in the years gone by. I guess we could start calling you a regular, couldn't we? I want to say a great big old Kentucky Afield welcome to our friend Harry Whitehead. Harry is with Gunners Taxidermy down in Jessamine County, Kentucky, and uh, we're glad to have him on the show. Harry, welcome back to the program, my friend. How are you? Great, Russ. Thanks for having me, man. I always enjoy doing these things for you. Well, I appreciate it. You do a great job. A lot of good information for our hunters out there. Harry, I want to jump right in. Of course, Harry, one of the big times, springtime in Kentucky. This is opening weekend of the wild turkey season. Opening weekend, and I know there's some folks out there that have already gotten a nice bird or are going to get it here very soon. Uh, Harry Whitehead, talk to folks about the uh, the care uh, of that harvest that they're going to bring to you come Monday or Tuesday morning and going to want that bird mounted. What do they need to know? Well, you know, as we said before, Russ, uh, the taxidermists can do a lot of things, but you, you, we can only deal with what you're bringing us. So with these turkeys, if you've got one that you've shot up real bad or there's a lot of feathers missing, that's probably not a good bird to uh, consider have mounted. You know, you got to take real care. What I like to do is got to aim right for that eye. And uh, and then the bird goes down. I get out there to him real quick. Now, you got to be careful with those spurs because sometimes I've, I've gotten a couple of puncture wounds from those jokers. And <laughs> you got to pick them up. I like to pick them up by those legs and then okay. just let them flop because that's a natural, with them flapping their wings, that's a natural uh, deal of movement for them, and they won't, uh, they won't lose any feathers. All right, so what I'm hearing you saying so far, Harry, is uh, put that if, if you've got a nice bird and you know this bird's going to be a mount, aim for the head and, and try right. to... Well, you know, they say a lot of times you aim at the bottom of the waddles. Well, you know, so the center of your pattern is going to be at the bottom of those waddles, but the bottom part of your pattern is going to be in the feathers. So, you know, I, I like to aim right at the eye. That way, the center of your pattern is in the eye, the head, and the lower part of your pattern is still in the, you know, the head. Uh, most taxidermists can get or have access to replacement heads if you should shoot that uh, that head okay. up too bad. Okay. Then, uh, you know, you can switch them out, so that's not a problem. But if they mess up that body and lose a lot of feathers, that that's a problem for you, correct? Uh, absolutely, and uh, I mean, you're compromising the quality of your of your mount, so. Uh, and again, you know, once you've got that bird shot, you know, a lot of times they'll get on the ground and kick and waller and roll. And I really like to get out there to them as fast as possible, being safe. You know, make sure your gun's on safe and set it down out of the way. Don't try to go out there and one-hand it because turkeys are strong and they'll start twisting on you. And I actually, last year I was in Kansas and shot a bird and, and reached down and had gloves on. 
and that joker started to spin, and it did just, I couldn't get rid of it. <laughs> it just, spur got caught up in my glove and just drove wow. that daggone spur right into my hand. And wow. It's, uh, it's not what you want to do. Harry Whitehead is our guest. He is a world-class taxidermist, Gunner's Taxidermy, down in Jessamine County, Kentucky. And, uh, uh, Harry, I've, I've heard you talk uh, many times in the past. Uh, I'll get you to go there again. The, the thought pattern that goes into uh, selecting a critter that's going to make a good mount. Not every, not every critter is going to make a good mount. And you say make good choices. Absolutely. Uh, you know, if you've got one that, you know, a trophy is different things to different people, though, Russ. You know, a, a guy's first bird or, or you know, uh, the first deer or whatever. You know, I mean, those are pretty special, pretty special uh, trophies. And, and there you kind of don't have a choice. First is first. But if you've got several birds on the wall and you're just looking to mount the exceptional one, then you really, you know, you can really get picky, and you know, you choose one that doesn't, that isn't shot up, that has real nice feathers, that, that, uh, you know, just a good-looking bird, and and thus you'll get a good-looking man in return. Harry, there are different kinds of mounts, especially when we talk about the wild turkey. Different options that that person has when he brings that bird to you. Share with us some of the some of the more popular uh, types of mounts and some of the things that uh, you have found uh, will make your customers happy. Well, you know, Russ, everybody kind of thinks of a turkey as, uh, with a, a tail spread, you know, in a strut position, but there's many more positions that, that you can do to really show off these birds, such as a half strut or a a hanging dead mount is kind of a cool thing. If you've got a couple of birds mounted already, you know, just something different. Uh, but a hanging dead or a flying is very nice. Mm-hmm. There's, a, there's a lot of different positions that you can put a bird in that uh, that will still show off the bird and, you know, the size of the bird and, and uh, make a nice mount. Uh, I've got one in here that I've won several awards with. That I shot the bird in Florida, so it's an Osceola. Well, I've got a big alligator coming up out of a little water splash, and the bird is actually supported by the tip of the gator's nose. Wow. And it, How it's creative. A, oh, it's, it's an open wing thing, and it looks really cool. I've, I've done real well in, co- uh, in competitions with that piece. But, uh, yeah, there's all kinds of options you can do to, to really show off your trophy. I've got a couple of minutes in this segment, Harry, and I certainly hope you'll hang around with us for a little while, but uh, let's close this segment a little bit with the care of the bird from the time that I take it in the field to the time that I get it to you. How do I want to care for that bird as I'm bringing it to your shop? Okay. Uh, we've already been over the don't shoot it up thing and try to try not to lose any feathers. Do not gut the bird, though. All right. There okay, you go. Do not gut the bird. Keep the bird dry. You do not want it to get it wet, like put it in an ice chest and cover it with ice. Uh, moisture promotes bacterial growth. You don't want to go that route. So keep the bird dry. Protect the feathers as best you can. Do not gut the bird and get it to your taxidermist as quickly as you can. Time is of the essence as as soon as possible, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and in most cases, I mean, I know here at Gunners, we, I couldn't take a man's meat out of his bird so if you bring it in fresh we will get and skin this bird for you and give your breast meat back to you and so, is that something that most taxidermists would would do for a hunter well i think so there's a lot of i don't want to speak for somebody else because right. i'll be getting phone calls they'll be giving me a hard time but, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah i mean that's what we do here and you know we try to we use clean scalpels and all that so there's not a problem with uh What's getting your breast meat back now? If you if you wait a little while, if it if it comes in frozen, I don't like to do that because then you run the risk of having of getting sick or whatever. It's not as good. And uh, in the in the minute or so we have remaining, it it all goes back to uh, Harry. We say it every time: a taxidermist can only work with what you bring him. So it's it's very critical that the hunter, uh, the man, the woman that's going to harvest the bird, got to do a good job on their end if they expect you. Uh, to do a good job on your end, and uh, that's... Uh... Absolutely. There is one thing I'd like to say, Ron, right. as far as uh, most taxidermists do have replacement parts. Okay. Uh, so if you've got an exceptional bird, like if it's got inch and a half or inch and three-quarter inch spurs or a huge beard or whatever, 
And this bird has flopped around. You couldn't get to it. It's, it's lost some feathers. Well, turkeys are kind of, uh, you can kind of sew in different pieces to them. So you can take that bad part out and sew in a new piece. And so, but that would be, I would think, an additional charge. Uh, so, but there is, there are other options if you've got a bird that you just really want to have done and it's subpar. A, a taxidermist that is, that is experienced can help the hunter out by getting new pieces and putting in. Harry, sit tight. We're going to be back with more. My name is Russ Kennedy. You are listening to Kentucky Field Radio. You're listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. My name is Russ Kennedy, and our guest on the program today, opening day of wild turkey season in Kentucky, Harry Whitehead is with us. And Harry stops by two or three times a year to spend some time with us on the show. He is a world-class taxidermist, an award winner, a prize winner, Gunner's Taxidermy is his shop in Jessman County, uh, Kentucky. Harry, I've asked you before, my friend, I'm going to ask you again, uh, what is the difference between a nice mount and an award-winning mount? What, what, what sets apart a world-class mount? Well, Russ, i tell you, you know, I always preach this, cleanliness. Uh, if you look at the feathers and they're all matted up and, and, you know, a turkey is, they've got segments or feather tracks that, that are very defined. You know, you, the breast feathers, the scap feathers, the wings, the pan on the top, the hackles on the back. You know, if, you ought to be able to look at this bird. The bird ought to be nice and clean and just, you can distinguish each of these feather patterns. Uh, you know, and then a paint job on the head. That's, uh, you know, most people look right at that head, and if that thing is is not, if, if it doesn't look right, if it's not looking back at you, well, hey, you know, maybe this isn't where you need to have your uh, turkey mounted at. But, you know, there's a lot of very good taxidermists uh, in Kentucky and, and uh, surrounding areas, and, and you just got to go. And my suggestion is just don't shop on the phone. Go to these guys' studios and, and see what kind of work they do. And uh, and don't be, I mean, everybody's concerned about price, but if somebody that's going to do one correctly, they're going to be charging up, you know, seven, six, seven, eight hundred bucks to, to be able to do a real nice uh, job on a turkey. So uh, my suggestion is to go and look and see what you're getting into. Don't just shop on the phone and, and look at price. Go see there what kind go. of quality you're doing. You know, that makes a lot of sense. I think about so many things, and it's often said that quality is remembered long after price is forgotten. So this is a this is wild turkey that you harvested is something you're going to have in your home for years and years and years. So if it's if it's a few extra bucks to get it done right, so be it, you know? So be it. I mean, if I had a nickel for every time I looked at something and wish I'd have took it somewhere else, you know, in the long run it's going to pay off. You know, I would think that there is some advantage, Harry, and I'll get your comments on this. Uh, if, if, if I'm considering bringing my harvested bird to you, I know, for example, that Harry Whitehead is a turkey hunter. You're out there with them. You know what they look like. You know what they look like in the field. And uh, I would think that uh, that being involved in the sport itself would make you Better at well, what well, you do. It's a huge advantage, Russ. I mean, it's very hard. How do you make something that's dead look alive when you don't know what it looks alive to start with? Thank you. So, very much. I mean, I guess for, I guess that's the way to put it. But uh, yeah, oh, I love turkey hunting. I, I live and breathe it. That's for sure. Well, since we've gone there, I know for a fact, having talked to you a little bit earlier in the week, um, you've already been on a really nice uh, turkey hunt. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you were down down Florida way doing a, a little little hunting. You had some success. Is that right? Absolutely. Actually, Russ, I've been to two places. I've, I've already been down to the Yucatan and, and taken two real nice uh Oscillated turkey gobbler, one wow. had two inch spurs. And then I went to Florida here, uh, back in, uh, back in March and, uh, took a real nice three year old bird and, and, uh, 
and had a great time. Gosh, I, I call, actually called in the whole daggone flock. I had my choice of five long beards in front of me, and and uh, and I took the strutter. I don't know that he was the biggest bird, but he was the meanest bird. I want to so ask that you. Was, that was a great hunt. Tell me a little bit about calling those birds in. I always like to talk to good turkey hunters about calling. You said you called in five nice ones. Give me some comments on calling turkeys and, and what what people do well and what they do wrong. Well, over calling is the, the, the big sin. Uh, but now, you know, I, I, I was very aggressive when I called in this flock. Actually, I heard the hens and started mocking the hens and I called the hens in, and then the gobblers followed them. So, you know, there's different strategies that, that I've used that work, and, and what you do today might not necessarily work tomorrow, because if you could figure a turkey out, I would love to talk to you, because, I, I, I mean, them suckers, <laughs> they, they never do what you expect them to do, but uh, I, I guess that's what makes it fun, though, Russ. Have you found any differences? Uh, you know, you, t- you talk about her, uh, hunting different areas of the country, do you have to approach it any differently uh, in in some areas as opposed to how you would hunt them here in our state? Uh, absolutely. Like the Miriam's bird, you have to be a whole lot more aggressive as far as being able to move. I mean, they're out there in that open country. I hunt uh, hunt Miriam's in, in Shadron, Nebraska, and, and you got to kind of use the lay of the land. If those things aren't coming to you, man, you got to get up and you got to hustle and you kind of got to get up and quarter to them because it seems that once you get in close enough to them then they'll respond to your calling if they're a distant piece away they just kind of ignore you and, and you're just going to you're wasting your your breath so uh being able to get up and move and, and and reposition yourself on some of those western birds is very very important again uh if i could prevail upon you uh would you recap the things that hunters need to know uh, if they're if they're thinking of uh, bringing a a potential mount to you or to their favorite taxidermist, whoever that may be, what are the things to keep in mind so that that taxidermist is able to provide you with a quality mount? Watch how they're shot. You know, aim at that head, aim at the eye. Keep your shot out of the uh, the feather part of the bird. Get out there and pick it up to keep it from flopping, so you don't have any feather loss there. Do not gut the bird, keep the bird dry, and most importantly, get it to your taxidermist as quickly as you can. There you go. Keep it dry. Try not to booger up too many feathers there. If you get a good shot, a good shot will take care of that. Absolutely. Uh, don't gut it. Don't field dress it. And get it to the taxidermist as quick as as possible. Keep it dry. Where will you be hunting uh, this season? Uh, I don't want you to give away all your secrets now. But what parts of uh, <laughs> what parts of the Commonwealth um, uh, do you head to during turkey hunting season, Harry? Well, I've got a little uh, little lease that I go to up in uh, Carroll County, up around Carrollton. So I'll be going up there and and uh, and uh, seeing if I can bag my easterns up there. And then uh, I'm traveling a little bit. I've still got uh, Nebraska and Kansas, where I'll be taking Miriams and, and Rios. And uh, so I won't get my world slam this year because I don't have enough time to go down to back to Mexico and shoot my ghouls. But uh, Hey, I'll uh, I'll give five out of the six a real hard time. I hope anyway. There you go. Well, we uh, we certainly wish you wish you all the best of luck. And um, well, Harry, while we're talking about these beautiful turkey mounts and all, uh, share with our listeners what would be reasonable uh, to expect in in turnaround time. And I know it's going to vary from from taxidermist to taxidermist, but this is not a quick process. It's going to take a little while. And and uh, typically, how long does it take? Uh, once the person bring, uh, brings the bird to you or somebody in, in your line of work? That's a difficult thing to kind of pin down. But it's, uh, it's definitely not a situation where I'm going to bring you a bird on Monday and pick it up next Monday. We're talking, I wish what? it was. <laughs> <laughs> Probably going to take a year. Happy. <laughs> and before, uh, before we let you go, while we still have a little time on the show, uh, you know, springtime in Kentucky, uh, for a lot of people, it's about wild turkey hunting. For many people, it's about the, uh, 
uh, arrival of the spring fishing season. Um, Harry, I, I'm, I'm assuming that you get a lot of fish into your shop. Any tips? Any tips to our anglers out there in the audience about uh, how to take care of a fish that they uh, may be bringing to your shop for mounting? What are some of the do's and don'ts uh, when it comes to fish? Well, I'll tell you, you know, the better, it's like anything else. The better you take care of that fish, the better and they, the, the, the better the product will be, you know, you, you want to protect that fish, get it in a, if, you're, if you know you're going to mount it, I'd go ahead and get it in a plastic bag and keep it on ice. That way it won't uh, split its fins, it won't get beat up in the live well, and it won't lose any scales. Uh, so it's basically the same thing with turkey or deer. You know, the better you take care of it, the, the more perfect the specimen is, the better quality mount you're going to end up with. What's turnaround time on a fish, for example? Is it going to be similar? Well, we do, here at Gunners, what we do, it depends on how many fish we have for production purposes. I, I do fish twice a year, so, you know, you're going to have a six or eight month turnaround on that as well. We stay a little, we stay busier than a lot of guys, so maybe some other people can get it back quicker, but I don't like to end up lying. So if I say <laughs> six months, invariably, be, it'll, it'll be eight. There you so, go. We just kind of, kind of work as fast and as good as we can, and, and we don't compromise any of the time. Little extra weight uh, is worth it in quality, I would think. Absolutely. Uh, again, Harry Whitehead is associated with Gunners Taxidermy. We like to talk about the wild turkey and wild turkey mounts this time of year as we as we enter into the opening weekend of the turkey hunting season uh, here in Kentucky. Harry, once again, I want to thank you, my friend. Always good to talk to you. Thanks, Russ. I appreciate you having me. I'm Russ Kennedy. You're listening to Kentucky Field Radio. Welcome back. This is Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. We get hit up to take surveys, it seems, at the oddest times. Emails have them. And my bet is most of the time we will say no, but these are helpful to companies because it helps them to know their customer's interest. Therefore, it helps them to serve us better. The Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife would like you to help them with the survey. I did it myself. 22 seconds. 22 seconds is all it took. Now, in exchange, you get a shot at winning a two-night stay at Lake Cumberland State Resort Park. Great place. You get a guided fishing trip and a few other things. Look up the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, and you can register right there on your Facebook page. Take the survey. I did it. 22 seconds. That's it. Spring Madness is the name of the contest, and it's brought to you by Realtree Extra Green and by Kentucky State Parks. The drawing in early May... The host of Kentucky's longest-running outdoor TV show, Tim Farmer, from Kentucky Afield TV, joins us next on Kentucky Afield Radio. First up, our fishing report. Hi, this is John Wheels with the Fish Report for Southeast Kentucky. It's finally starting to feel like spring, so I encourage people to get out and enjoy the resources we have to offer. Fishing's been good lately at Lake Cumberland. Striped bass are up in the creeks, mostly mid-creek up to the head, and they're very shallow, close to shore, being caught on live bait, drifted right next to the shoreline. Also in Lake Cumberland, crappie fishing's been good, especially in the headwater area, up in the upper reaches of the Cumberland River near mouth of Laurel. Those are being caught on minnows or jigs. Also, all the major trout streams in the Daniel Boone National Forest have been stocked in the month of April. Those can be caught on a variety of baits, including inline spinners and small jigs. And finally, uh, there's several area lake cleanups happening in April. I encourage you to get out and take care of the environment. You can contact our agency for any lake cleanups near your area. And as always, good luck. Keep fishing. This is Rob Rold in the Northwestern Fishery District with an update on the angling opportunities in our area. No Lynn, white bass are very active. They're on their spring spawning run up in the upper river, around the Cane Run, Bacon Creek area, all the way up to Broad Ford, Wheeler's Mill. Anglers are catching a lot of nice white bass, 12, 14 inch stuff. Fishing curly tail jigs or live crayfish, both work well. At Nolan and Rough River Lakes, both crappie are active. Anglers are catching them in brush piles, five to 10 feet deep along the main lake. 
But as the weather is warming and so is the water, these fish are becoming more shallow. Should be spawning within a week or so, so watch for these fish to continue moving more shallow and follow them into the shallow areas. That's some angling updates from the Northwestern Fishery District. Please remember to be safe on the water and good luck. For Kentucky and Barker Lakes, this is the springtime of the year when fishing changes daily. And so right now, early spring fishing is if the sun is shining and the wind's not blowing, you need to be on the lake. The crappie, they're starting to do their spawning activities. And so right now they're scattered. Sunshiny day, I'd be casting those banks with a little curly tail or a rooster tail. Might catch you some good black crappie up on those rocky shorelines. Again, when the sun's hitting it, those rocks warm up the water there faster. For the bass fishermen, you know, this is the time of year when everybody's talking Alabama rigs out there on the ledges catching multiple bass at the same time. The lake is about 358 elevation. That's about two foot above normal. Anticipate that it will probably fall sometime in the next few weeks to get back on the guy curve. But uh, this is Paul Reister. Find you a good day and go fishing. Tim Farmer next after the break. It's time to register for Kentucky's Elk Hunts. This is Tim Farmer. The Kentucky Fish and Wildlife website is Elk Central and the only place to enter this year's draw. Elk hunting in Old Kentucky. Take it from me, there's nothing like it. 1,000 names will be drawn, and with the pick two option, you got to like your odds. The deadline is midnight, April 30th. The Kentucky Elk Draw. Enter at fw.ky.gov. Again, fw.ky.gov. This is Kentucky Afield Radio. I am Charlie Baglin, your host, and I have another host sitting right across the counter from me who is recognizable by, I want to say, everyone in the state who likes to hunt, fish, or boat. His name is Tim Farmer. He is the host of Kentucky Afield Television. And I want to say that Kentucky Afield TV is marking its 60th year on the air this year in 2013. It started back in 1953. I've done the math right. That's 60 years. He is always on the go with the TV show. And so, Tim, what we have done, we'll just be honest, we're recording this interview in advance for turkey season. Maybe it's too soon to know, but does Kentucky Field TV have a working plan yet for a turkey show? You know, I have my favorite spots. Now, turkey hunting, as you can imagine, is a is a pretty intense deal. Now, when you go packing a camera into the field and, and other people, your chances lessen. As you know, as we as we go out there, we want to come back with something. I mean, our viewers are expecting that. So we try our best to find the most likely spots where we can go out and, and take a turkey. And I always scout way ahead of time. In fact, we'll start in the next couple of weeks. And as you mentioned, we're doing this ahead of time. But, you know, most folks are starting to think about turkey season in February. You know, mm-hmm. the first warm day they have, and they might see some turkeys standing out in the field. Most folks who turkey hunt are getting out... Their, their calls and driving their wives and, and, and housemates crazy with turkey sounds already. Turkey don't know what's you coming. They don't know Tim Farmer from the man on the moon. <laughs> but I, is it fair to say that Tim Farmer is Superman, Hunter? No. Do people look at you when it's opening day of turkey season that you absolutely have to go out and get a grand bird when when you go fishing that you have to catch a huge bass that you have to bring back a a wall mountable harvest every time you go anywhere no turkeys can humble any person out there doesn't matter how much experience you have they have their own mindset they do exactly what they want to do and it doesn't matter if you do everything perfectly now when i talk about the viewers expecting to see something it's a television show you know they hope to see us get a turkey as we hope to get a turkey but there are no guarantees when it comes to turkey Mm -hmm. now we hope and we try to do everything right if we're if we're using a blind we try to set our blind up in the right spot we try to watch them weeks ahead of time but any turkey hunter will tell you the best laid plans you can see them every day in one spot. You can know they're roosting in one spot. You can d- do your homework to the T, and you show up on opening day, and they may not be there. <laughs> and you'll go into this knowing that wildlife, turkeys included, are creatures of habit. What they do today, chances are they'll do again tomorrow. But 
Somebody may have run them off the roost. Uh, some natural predator may have run them on the roost, run them off the roost. You might not see those birds for three or four days. The strangest things can happen during turkey season because, you know, seriously, they have a brain about the size of a pea. You'll see turkeys do the craziest things that they're just not supposed to do. For example, for example, you got a bird coming. You're out in the field. Here comes a tom. You're making a noise. He's coming. You kind of shut up. Everything's working. You quiet down. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. There may be a one strand of wire between you and him, and he may look at that strand of, of fence and just not cross it. That's called getting hung up. And knowing that he could fly over it, doesn't know that he could fly over it, jump over it. Remember, brain the size of a pea. So if, there's no calculation that you can do that makes anything a certainty in the turkey field. You That bird may get hung up and just sit there and gobble for two hours and drive you crazy. He may come in with another tom, and they may just gobble at each other. And and, and you got the perfect decoy spread. you got everything going perfect. And they may just look at each other and then walk off. There are so many variables. A jake might come in and beat a tom up and run him off. We've seen so many odd things in which there's no guarantees. But I can tell you this, it's always entertaining and it's always fun. And I don't strive to get the biggest turkey out there. You know me. I like to eat the meat that uh, is provided by, by nature out there. I love to go out and kill a bird. I'll kill a jake. If there's a lot of jakes in the area, and I see just a huge amount of jakes, I'll gladly take a jake to come home with some meat. Now, everybody likes to get that big bird with that huge beard and those and those big spurs. But, hey, let me tell you what. When I'm out there in the field and opportunity presents itself, I'm going to shoot that bird. Again, if there's a passel of hens and jakes out there, I will take a jake, which is an immature tom. Well, what you're describing doesn't just happen to you. There's a count out there at about 90,000 turkey hunters across the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And what you're describing could happen to any of them, but they're not producing a TV show that has to air Saturday night and again Sunday afternoon. Right. And so there, there has to be pressure to hunt more days than you normally would. Uh, what, what is the secret to making sure you come back with a show? There is no set secret. You just have to hope that the experience you have gained in the woods will help you out in that endeavor. Now, when you have night and hail, say, okay, I've been hunting turkeys for X amount of years, and when they tell you that they can go out into turkey woods and be humbled and come back with nothing, you know, and I would consider them the best in the world. So those guys will tell you that as fun and as exciting as turkey hunting is, there wouldn't be a challenge in it if you didn't sometimes come back and just get skunked and come back scratching your head. If you went out and sat for 20 minutes, shot a bird opening day, I don't think the challenge would remain there for you. But turkeys never cease to amaze, and, and they do just weird things that you can't imagine. And that's part of the joy of turkey hunting, because you never know what they're going to do. Is there any shame in going on, have you ever gone on the air and said, we didn't get a bird this year? Have Absolutely. you ever had to do that? Absolutely. And there's no shame in that. And we we don't have shame in that. And, you know, with, with this job, um, it, which is a great job, but we have other things that we have to do. As you know, we put on a weekly show, which is a pretty uh, stout endeavor. It keeps, it keeps all us guys busy. Um, there is a time when we say, okay, hey, we can't spend any more time out here. We have other things that we have to do. So we have X amount of days that we can go out and try this. And, and hey, it can get just as frustrating as, as the first-time hunter. And it can get just as frustrating as the guy who's been hunting 40 years and goes out there and just gets gets humbled, as Night and Hell say. What is the one piece of advice that you could give a turkey hunter, regardless if they're new this year or been doing it for 20 years? Watch, learn, scout, but the biggest thing is, Charlie, and we talked about earlier, so many people tend to go out and they watch these television shows and listen to these tapes of these folks who are calling, 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 and the bird answers and answers and answers. And he comes in hot. Call, reply. Call, reply. Call, reply till the bird shows up in your face and you shoot him and you go home and the, the, the nice music plays and, and you know everything's wonderful. It typically does not work that way. Now, you have to know that people are selling their products on some of these shows and they're going to show you how you know use their call mm -hmm. and that bird's going to come in. The honest answer to that is 
find the call that works best for you, that you can make the most natural turkey sound with. Try to sound natural. Understand the cadence of calling. Calling is your most important friend when you're out there, and it can be your biggest enemy because when you're making that calling sound, they understand certain cadences. And, and That's right. A turkey knows what a turkey is listening for. And once you see just a little bit of response... It's easy to go overboard, and that's where that overcalling can come in to defeat you. The biggest, biggest mistake is overcalling. Why, what I have found, and, and this is over many, many, many years, and again, doesn't work every time, but if you establish contact with that bird, you're sitting in the woods, you make a hen sound. Whether it's a tree yelp, and you're out there early, and you're just trying to establish the fact that you're a hen, and you want some company, and Mr. Tom is looking for a girlfriend. So you make that initial sound, which is a sound that they make in the tree, just a tree yelp. Just a tiny little yelp, 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 yelp. Just letting, letting him know that there's a bird in the tree. You don't even have to use a call. You can, use, you can make a turkey noise with your mouth if you practice enough. But understand the sound that that hen makes. If you've got one goblin and you hear him going away, you got issues. Now, you can try to turn him around. You can do whatever you want to do. But if he comes off the tree and is going the other way, you're going to have to try to get up and go head him off in some instances. A lot of people will make noise and make noise and make noise and try to get that bird to come back, and they'll notice he's going away. Well, that bird doesn't like what you're doing, or he's got other plans that he's already made. He knows where they're hens, or he might be with hen. He might be hinned up. Other times, you make a call, you establish contact. He's gobbling. He's coming your way. And where a lot of people will make more and more noise, and they get more and more excited, and that's where that's where you might mess up. That's that, where the mistake comes. That's where the mistake comes. You get excited. The adrenaline flows, and you're making noise. You're also moving when you're making that noise. A lot of times you're using a slate, or you're excited and moving around. They can see movement, Charlie, like you cannot believe. Their eyes, we can't even understand how the bird's eye works and how they can pick movement out. They're looking for predators the whole life. They're looking up for, you know, For any kind of predatory bird that might steal their poults, they're looking around for coyotes, for foxes, any kind of predatory animal. If you blink, they could see you. You are exactly right. You have to be camouflaged. If you exhale and there's steam coming from your mouth, they can see that. Yeah. So that is the problem with, with a bird. And then you'll be perfectly camouflaged. But if they're in that flight mode, you know, fight or flight mode, and they're looking around and they're suspicious and you move your finger, they're gone. That bird's coming. Most people start intensifying their calling. Then they notice he stops. Nothing. And they'll try to increase their calling. What I have found that works for me well over the years is if you establish contact and he's coming, stop. Let him come. Timmy, let me stop you right there and say thanks for stopping by. We're up against the clock. And congratulations to you and the crew on 60 years of absolutely excellent outdoor television. I'm about right back at you. (laughs) Special report up next after the break on Kentucky Field Radio. This is Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin, and we are into our last segment. If you watch David Letterman or Jay Leno, you notice two types of guests they have on the show. One, it could be they're going to talk about a topic. Doesn't really matter who talks about the topic, as long as they cover the topic and do it in some kind of an interesting fashion. The second is the pure celebrities. You know, Don Rickles, Jennifer Aniston, Ryan Seacrest, just their very presence on TV, out of character, intrigues us. In fact, they could talk about inane things, such as their dog. Makes them feel like they're a little bit more like us, regular folks. That's kind of the way it is around here. We know Tim Farmer. We know which jokes of his are funny and which aren't. Earlier this half hour, we had had a conversation with Tim on the subject of turkey. And that's well and good, but what about other things in his life? You know, you know, he has a life, too, and it's interesting to talk about what's going on with Farmer behind the scenes. He's a married man, got kids, had a dream of being in the Marines and actually working in law enforcement that changed one day due to a little motorcycle accident. So in two weeks, we're going to sit down and talk candidly with Tim and probably ask a few questions that you would like to hear answered instead of just talking deer hunting and turkey, bass fishing, and 
shooting a bow with his teeth. We are very much officially into spring now, at least according to the calendar. We've been into it for, what, three weeks? But the groundhog has certainly taken its share of grief. I have heard threats on his life. Here it is, supposed to have an early spring, and yet as recently as Easter, uh, temperatures like in uh, the 30s, 40s, and feels more like winter out. I think we've rounded the bend. I want to take you back to when Kentucky Field Radio was just a five-minute spot. I mean, it was more like a, a radio report. But those same questions about spring, how do you know when it's spring? Well, the days are longer. Well, the air is warmer. More to it than that by a long shot. As we go back with the Kentucky Field Radio Audio Archive. Behind the Scenes with Spring, next on Kentucky Field Radio. Spring is in the air, but how do we know? The days are longer, the air is warmer, but there are signs of spring even more certain, and these fascinating facts are found in nature. For me, one of the earliest signs of spring is the smell of skunks, because springtime is when skunks come out and begin to mate. That smell on the highways is a sign that the skunks are in love. We go inside outdoors with Tim Sloan with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, as well as with biologists from the State Nature Preserves Commission. We're out to decipher clues from Mother Nature to determine if spring has, in fact, sprung. Another real sign of spring is the frogs calling. Uh, Spring peepers, upland chorus frogs, they come out on warm, rainy nights and uh, call like crazy. And that's the male frog calling to attract the mate. You know that spring is here when frogs are calling. Spring is a season we hear, feel, see, and smell. Ecologist and botanist Mark Evans. Coming up right through the snow and the cold weather, there's a bunch of what we call the ephemeral spring wildflowers, the very earliest spring wildflowers, things like bloodroot, celandine poppies. The early um, flowers have evolved to withstand these bouts of real cold weather that can happen even though it's springtime. They actually do have nature's antifreeze in their cells. Signs of spring don't always come draped in sunshine. Some clues are so subtle that if we're not quick to notice, they may fly right past. The one thing I look for early in the year that lets me know spring is approaching is the migration of common green darners. Common green darners are large green and blue dragonflies that migrate early in the spring from the southern states. and Most people probably don't realize that dragonflies migrate. Invertebrate biologist Ellis Loudermilk says an increased presence of insects is a sure sign of spring. Well, you might go down to your local pond and see a large green and blue dragonfly fly by and think that that was just normal for that pond, but it could be a dragonfly that actually emerged from a pond in Florida or Alabama, and he's flying through Kentucky from the south like many of the migrant songbirds. Songbirds are returning as part of spring's dazzling show of colors and critters. 75% of Kentucky songbirds have spent their winter in Central and South America. Their return isn't triggered by temperature, but rather by day length. They're apparently cued by just minutes difference in uh, the duration of days over a short period of time because, you know, the tropics, the day length doesn't change that much. I mean, we notice the days are longer now than they were in January, but it's really subtle cues to them. Brainerd Palmer Ball is a zoologist who tells us that the travel itinerary of songbirds is one of the more precise measures of spring. We've all heard the story of the swallows of Capistrano, which return to the mission every year on the same day. Little do we know that story isn't unique to Southern California. We have a lot of birds in Kentucky that come back in the spring the same day each year or about the same week. They vary everywhere from like the barn swallows to the chimney swifts that have come all the way from the Andes Mountains of Ecuador. All of us can imagine how those birds could figure out what south was and go hundreds and hundreds of miles south. But how they get back to the same yard after having traveled thousands of miles and a lot of them do it with great timing accuracy. I mean, as I say, if it wasn't for changes in the weather, a lot of birds come back within the same week. Spring is in the air and in the water. Fish go through a lot of interesting changes in the spring. Something as common as a striped shiner. Uh, Most people would just call it a shiner or a minnow. It's a nondescript fish, but this time of the year it gets a bright red color on its side. Some of them as beautifully colored as any tropical fish that you could find in any pet store. We also know it's spring by what we don't see. The migratory birds of winter, such as ducks and geese, have flown back north. And speaking of migrations, 
Migrations. Salamanders go through these really interesting migrations. On uh, warm, rainy nights, you may see masses of salamanders crawling across deserted country roads. And what they're doing, they're heading for their breeding ponds where they'll assemble by the hundreds and breed and lay their eggs. And some of these species of salamanders then go underground or out of sight and you don't see them again for the rest of the year. Wildlife biologists tell us that we can identify every season through the behavior of nature in wildlife. We also know it's spring by the behavior of people. It's that magical time when we come out of our shell and say, the best time of the year is here. That's true. One way to know it's spring is the presence of insects. Kentucky Field Radio is all about how we interact with nature, if that's hunting or fishing, wildlife photography. Next week, we will talk about the fascinating subject of beekeeping. More people do this than I ever realized. We've got a couple of experts lined up and a hobbyist, and I think you'll enjoy the show. So join us. We will go inside outdoors again in a week. My name's Charlie Baglin, and this is Kentucky Afield Radio.